Today on Ask This Old House. This fireplace outside of Chicago was built without a mantle. I'll fix that. I can see that this stone is at least eight inches thick, so that's gonna give us the support that we're gonna need for a new mantle. Moving into a house that's been smoked in for many, many years may not only be tough to clean, but might be bad for your health. We'll explain. And what is this gonna set Adam back? Adam is gonna have a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> Smoking kills. That's it. Well, a job like this, I would say it's about. And to control all the lights in this kitchen, you have to hit this switch, and this switch, and this switch, and this one. I'll fix that. Hi there, I'm Kevin O'Connor and welcome back to Ask This Old House, where if you've got a question about your house, we'd love to hear from you because we have got the experts with the answer. Hey, good morning, Tommy. Hey, Kevin, how are you? Good. Did you get that um, email from the guy? He's thinking about buying the house, but he's worried because the previous owner smoked for like 30 years and it stinks and he doesn't know what to do? Yeah. Well, that's a problem. And I know Ross and Mara are working on that. They've got a solution. Nothing for me. I got nothing. All right. Well, we got someone on it. Ross, you yeah. got that one? Yeah. So we, so we got it. Mara and I got it under control. It's a thing called third hand smoke. Really? All third right. hand. Yep. And so it's, uh, it's potentially harmful to our health, and uh, we're going to work on it. It's not just a nuisance, huh? Not just a nuisance smell. Yeah. Right. Get on it. Thank right. you. Hey, Richard. Hey, how are you? All right. What are you working on? You know, when I always go to the trade shows and look for new products to show, and this thing caught my eye. You know, it's a faucet, but it has a little thing on here. It's a bubbler. Oh, cool. Look at that. You do know that up here we're the only ones who say bubbler. Really? Everyone else says water fountain. <laughs> okay. But anyway, that's so very cool. It's pretty handy for brushing your teeth. You're going to save using a Dixie cup. And, and it makes a lot of sense. It's about 500 bucks. Yep. Not too bad. And uh, of course, in my household, my kids would immediately put their finger on it and. Spit. Ooh, go, look go, out. Go. Stop! <laughs> That's exactly what they would do. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Welcome to Chicago. Well, thank you very much. I love the neighborhood. So when I was coming in, I saw a mix of colonials, Tudors, mainly contemporary houses like this one. Right. It's, it's a great neighborhood. We've lived in this neighborhood 25 years. We moved from our traditional house from just down the street okay. to this house that we've always loved, wow. this contemporary. We love it. Right. And you wrote me about... A mantle? I did. All right, yeah. well, let's take a look. Okay, let's All go. Right. All right, this is the contemporary. I love the openness. It is. It's a yeah. wonderful house. This is the fireplace. Okay. We love it. Last two Christmases, we've really realized we've missed the mantle from our other house. And on that mantle, we used to keep all our uh, stocking holders with right. our stockings on it. And we've had those for years, so it'd be nice to have a mantle. Okay. Yeah. In a 1980s contemporary house, it wouldn't be unusual to have a mantle, and it wouldn't be unusual not to have a mantle. In this particular case, if we put a mantle in, it would look like it's supposed to look. But as I look at this fireplace, it's nice and flat, which is a great start. I'm looking at the thickness of the fireplace. I can see that this stone is at least eight inches thick, so that's going to give us the support that we're going to need for a new mantle. And I think I have one out in the truck, actually. Oh, that's wonderful. Let's go check it out. All right, look what we have. Oh, it looks Isn't this wonderful. nice? I got it out of a company from Ohio. Beautiful red oak. I had it finished to match all your finish inside. But look at the key component. It's hollow. Hollow. So the reason we love a hollow mantle is because it's going to allow us for easy application. Why don't we get started? Great. All right, so because we don't have any way of mounting the mantle onto the stonework, what I've done is I've made up a cleat. And all it is is a couple two by fours nailed together, and it's gonna help me mount the mantle. So the first thing I wanna do is establish the height. Uh, mantles are usually set around 54 inches, which puts me into this area right here. So um, unfortunately, I have a bump right in my zone. So we're either going to have to go a little lower or a little higher. I think I'd like it a little higher just because it's such a big fireplace. Okay, great. So we'll end up somewhere in this area. Okay. But the first thing we have to do is find center of the stonework. So if you wouldn't mind going over there and holding my tape. You're going to want to be flush with the outside stone. 
Okay, we're looking like we have about 76 inches, which will give us a center of 38, which is right here. I've already marked the center of my cleat. We're gonna match it up with the center of our stone. There, hold it securely, because I'm gonna put a level on it, which is very important. Looks like I have to come up, hold steady. Looking good right there. Now what we need to do is find some areas to drill our bolts. What I'm looking for is a mortar joint, preferably in between two stones, and I'll drill right through that. So I wanna mark my two by four in between those two stones, like that. And now I'm gonna come over, I see a stone, I see a stone, there's a mortar joint. So I'd like to go right in between those. So now I'm looking for, again, two stones here and here. There's my mortar joint. So I'm going to try to do, drive into that cavity. All right. So what I've done is I prepped our cleat for the stone. I've drilled our holes in the back of the cleat. I hogged out just so it can take some of the depth of the stone that's jumping out into our profile. And we're going to attach it with a wedge anchor. You see when I torque down the bolt, this anchor is going to expand. That's going to lock us into the stone so the mantle doesn't tip out or fall out. Good. All right, so let's put this up. All right, put the drill right into the pilot hole. Start the drill off slow, but go in, you'll know when you hit the stone. Okay. Try it again. Pull. Pull the trigger. Keep going. Push. Keep going. Now you can watch this old house and ask this old house anytime, anywhere. Download our new app to stream full episodes to your tablet, your TV, and your phone. Binge classic episodes, catch up on recent renovations, and get step-by-step -step help projects all around the house. Best of all, it's free. The most trusted home improvement information is now available on your Amazon Fire TV, Roku, Apple TV, iOS, and Android devices. Download the This Old House streaming app today. Pull it out. All right, nicely done. Very cool. All right. All right, now come in and give me some taps on that bolt. Okay. Just easy taps until you get through that wood. Okay, now you go in first. Okay. And all it is is going to slip right in. Walk it in. So now all we have to do is attach the mantle to the cleat. And we're going to do that using brass screws and brass grommets on our pre-finished mantle. All right, Margaret, you needed a place to hang the stockings. What do you think? Oh, it looks great. Nice. It's, it's a little too early for Christmas, but uh, is it ever? No, nah, it's never too right. early. And it, uh, really, they look great. And uh, when we do have Christmas, we'll have family over. We great. can have all our stockings up. Oh, I love it. I love it. Yeah, and so I'm so glad you came to Chicago. Right. Thank you for having me yeah, out. I had a ball you. today. Nice job, Mark. Thank you. So that just a couple fun. questions for you. Why sure. did you deliberately drill through the mortar and not the stone? I would think the stone would be more solid than the mortar. Sure. So I assess every situation as soon as I walk in. The first thing I noticed about that job was the stone, although it was nice and thick, 8 to 10 inches, which I like, mm -hmm. uh, was very brittle. Oh. So that's why I made the decision to go in between the stones and hit the joints. Had it been beefy stone or brick or something like that, could you have gone right into it? And would you have gone into it? I definitely would have. New England has great stone for application, so Damn, right. something around here we would we definitely would have drilled right into. Gotcha. And in that case, you had a hollow back, but sometimes people got an old piece of wood, antique piece of wood, a beam or something. It's solid. Right. In that case, what do you recommend? In that case, I always love a post. Uh, my post can be re-rod. A post can be a lead pipe. Mm. Uh, before we touch the pipe, what we're going to want to do is throw epoxy into that hole. That's so, going to so secure the pipe. So drill in with a big bit right there. Yep. Fill with epoxy. Right. So overdrill, fill with epoxy, take your post, yep. 
put your post in, it'll get nice and snug right away. Gotcha. I would add epoxy to this end. Yep. And then just apply my mantle, epoxy push it in, epoxy. hold it for a Very second, nice. and it sets right up. All right, and you brought us a nice little demonstration. Sure. So in this case, we're talking post down the length of whatever solid piece of wood. Yep. The drilling in the back, and then you would just sort of carefully epoxy, push that in, and you're sort of in the same situation. Exactly. Very nice. All right, good. Great information. And I'll tell you what, it looks like you made her day. Oh, we had a ball over there. She was great. Nice job. All right, thanks, Kevin. Hey guys. Hey Kevin. So, so, oh, thank you. We're working it. on Adam's question. Yeah, we were just talking about it. So Mauro, you heard this, right? Adam's yes. thinking about buying a house. He's got two small children and the previous owner smoked for like 30 years. It smells, he's worried, you know, can he fix it? Does he have any risks? Um, Ross was saying earlier that he might. Yes. You familiar mm -hmm. with this situation? I have done projects like this before. You have. And honestly, I'm not looking forward to do it again. Oh, wow. <laughs> Why? What is involved? Uh, you're going to be do dealing with a lot of uh, strong odors and then staining walls. And uh, it's a lot of work to clean up. We started by top to bottom, all surface. Uh, we're going to scrub everything with the uh, TSP solution. And then everything is done clean. Wait, we wait, all surfaces. So all TSP, surface. ceilings, walls, ceilings, floor. walls, uh, doors, windows, all floors, yep. baseboards. Yep. Oh, yeah. The whole thing. Okay. Don't skip any spot. Yeah. So after everything is dry, we'll come back. You know, five days later, with the um, we're gonna use a uh, two coats of primer, an alcohol-based primer. Never even heard of an alcohol-based primer. What does that do for well, us? It's a, a less uh, impermeable than the uh, traditional primer. Really? It makes everything bridge back again. So less permeable is a way of sort of trying to encapsulate those surfaces yes. and then put the paint on top and of it. And then put two coats of paint on paint on top of it, uh. and it's. Ready to go. And what is this going to set Adam back? Adam is going to have a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> Smoking kills. <laughs> well, a job like this, I would say it's about $25,000. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Really? Well, Kevin, it's a tremendous amount of work to get to this, to okay. clean this up. So that's yeah. tough news. And so well, what is the science behind this? Like, what's yeah, going so I think on? it helps to define. So there are really three different kinds of smoke, right? you got first-hand smoke. I think most people are familiar with That's the person who's smoking a c cigarette or cigar. Second-hand smoke is the person who's in close vicinity to the person who's smoking. Third-hand smoke, that's the new one. That's been studied right now for the last 10 to 15 years from the yeah. scientific community. And what that really is, is the chemical residue that's left behind from the smoke. What, what are the chemicals to generally, do you know? So we're talking about nicotine, we're talking about tar, and a whole host of other harmful chemicals. Left behind, meaning they're physically left on the surfaces in this house. Yeah, so think of the smoke and think of it leaving behind this residue that gets deposited in all the surfaces of the building. Yeah. And think about that, that, that that, um, those chemicals get absorbed into the actual porous materials of the building. Oh, porous, so, meaning? So think of everything, wood, drywall, your flooring, your carpeting, your upholstery, your furniture, everything. Insulation? Right? Insulation behind the drywall. Oh. So it gets absorbed into everything. And so if you've got, in Adam's case, for someone smoking for 30 plus years in that building, it's gonna get actively absorbed into everything. And then what it tries to do is equalize. So it tries to evaporate back into the indoor air. So after, so let's say, 30 years in this case, is, yeah. are you suggesting that cleaning is no longer sufficient? Because that sounds like it's a surface treatment. Yeah. It, no longer so. What do you do yeah, then? Well, in a long term, uh, you know, the experts say you have to remove all of those materials. Oh. I mean, it's, for Adam's case, it would be a gut rehab. It would be crazy. It, oh, my gosh. Yeah. It make okay. 25000 look cheap. Yeah. Oh, so that goes yeah. through the AC vents and uh, electrical outlets yeah. goes all behind the walls and stuff, right? People think that actively cleaning the surfaces, running the fans, opening the windows, putting in new air filters, that's going to solve it. Third-in smoke is a different animal. It's getting absorbed into the actual porous materials of the building. So you say this is new information. Um, how good yep. is the science and who's getting harmed by this? Like how legit is this whole thing? Yeah, so it's only been studied for the last 10, 15 years, like I said, and you know, with kids, it's they're at the highest risk. They're, they have developing bodies and they what the scientists have found is that it can get through the skin. So just like a nicotine patch for someone that's trying to wean off of cigarettes. Uh, they, they found this in kids who've been exposed to the third-hand smoke? Third-hand smoke, yeah. So there's been a study that looked at kids exposed to second-hand smoke and kids exposed to third-hand smoke, yep. and they both had similar levels of nicotine in their urine, right? Mm -hmm. So the kids are crawling around in the upholstery and you know, the floors, carpeting, and so it's getting absorbed, and all those chemicals we're talking about get absorbed into their skin. All right, so who's going to notify Adam? <laughs> 
I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what? bad yeah. news for Adam, but I guess better to know than not to know. Yeah, and he yeah. can make the uh, the proper decision. Yeah, yeah. Wow, you guys did your homework. Thank you. Well, thanks. Thank you. Want to tackle all your home improvement projects with confidence? Join This Old House Insider, a new streaming service from This Old House, the iconic Emmy-winning series that inspired a generation of home enthusiasts. Stream over 1,000 episodes of This Old House and Ask This Old House commercial-free. Watch it all in the This Old House app. And join live online Q&As with our experts. Best of all, you can try Insider free for seven days. To join, go to thisoldhousemembership.com. Thanks for having me over. Thanks for coming, Heath. Let me show you the lighting in the kitchen. All right. So we have six different lights here in the kitchen. Um, I like the configuration of it, but it, the switch is a little bit weird. So okay. this one here controls two. Okay. Then I have another switch here. This one controls one. <laughs> All right. This one has one. That does another one. And then a final switch here controls the last two. That is a lot of switches for six lights. Yeah, I can appreciate each one having its own control, but it can get a little excessive. Sure. It's nice having them broken up so you can control them individually, but at the same time, I'm sure you want to be able to turn them all on or all off, especially if you're going to bed and you want to leave the room. You don't want to go back and forth to turn multiple switches off. Oh, absolutely. Especially when I'm going to bed, it's always that one over there. It's I always, always the forget. Furthest one yep. away. Yeah, always. Okay, well, I think I have a good solution for this. I think we can replace the switches, keep the local control like you have, and still give you the ability to turn everything all on or all off, especially when you leave the room. All right, great. All Sounds right. fantastic. Let me grab some tools. All right, Kathy. So I've turned the power off, and I've taken the switches out to take a look and see how they're wired. They are wired like we thought. They are single pole switches. And what that means is one switch is gonna control either a single light or a group of lights. Uh, in a room like this, we typically want to have a three-way, which means we'd have a switch on this end and a switch on the other end when you leave the room to control the group of lights. So you can turn it on and off in either location. Okay. Uh, we can still wire for that. We can still put a wire through the basement, go from one switch to the other switch, and get that into place. But the problem is you have a finished basement, and we'd have to do a little bit of damage to make that work and a little bit of time and labor. Uh, the other thing we can do now, though, is they do make a smart switch that'll solve this for us. So we can take the existing switches you have install a smart switch in its place, it wires the exact same way that, that one does. The plus to this is we still have the local control that you currently have, but then we can pair it with a remote, and the remote can group all of them together to turn them all on or all off together. The nice part is we can also install the plate over it to make it look like a conventional wall switch, and we don't need to wire it or cut anything into the wall. That's great. And finally, we'll add the smart hub. The smart hub will give you control of the system over your phone or a tablet. It can let you group individual light switches or other controls together or separate them. And you can set timers, reminders, events to control anything in the house and add to it in the future. All right, that sounds great. Let's put them in. All right. And the nice part about the new one is that it's simply two black wires and a ground. So it doesn't matter which ones they go on, we can just reattach them. So let's see the new one. So we're going to push the new dimmer back into place. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to slide the dimmer into its wall bracket. Slide the wall bracket into place. We'll put the plate over it to get our alignment. And then we'll slide the plate off and mark the holes. Now we can put our drywall anchors in and mount this. All right, so in this box, we have two single pole switches, one controlling one light each. What we're gonna do in this case is combine the two to control both lights off of one switch. And what this will do, it'll let us install the wireless remote in the second spot, so we'll still have the local switch here controlling two lights, and the remote will still give us the ability to have the all on, all off we're looking for.
Over by the sink, we'll replace the existing switch with a hardwired smart switch. This will allow these lights to pair with the rest of the lights. I won't add a remote here since there are already a number of switches at this location, and you won't need all on, all off from this location very often. All right, Kathy, and now we're gonna pair the remote to our switch. And what we're gonna do is press and hold the bottom button on the switch. The LED is gonna light up telling us it's in program mode. And now that it's in program mode, we'll press and hold the bottom button on our remote. Once they link, the LEDs will flash again, and we can test it out. And that tells us that the two are linked. Wow. All right, Kathy, and now you're gonna press and hold the bottom button on that right switch. Okay. And we're gonna hold that for about six seconds until the LEDs light up to tell us it's in programming mode. All right, it's ready. Perfect, and now I'm gonna press and hold the bottom button on this remote, and that's gonna link that switch to this remote as well. All right, so that's, let's test it. We'll turn this off from there. And let's try turning this on. Hey, we have light. We have light. All right, and now that we've linked all the devices together, we're gonna to go ahead and test them. And we're gonna show that the devices on that side of the room operate the same as these do. Okay. So let's go ahead and try the all on. Wow, Perfect. that's great. And now you still have the ability to control locally as well. So these two will turn on only if you want. And we can dim. That's excellent. All right, and the last thing we did is we took that smart hub and we tied it into your home network. And what that's going to let us do is it's going to let you control the system with your phone through the app, or you can actually use voice command if you set it up. Oh, that's perfect. That's so much more convenient. Thank you so much, Heath. No problem. Thank you. And thanks for having huh. me. Nice fix, Heath. Um, I like the solution, although the problem seems pretty quirky, right? I mean, we're talking four yeah. switches, three locations, six lights. That's not that typical. A little unusual to have that many switches for that few lights. So other places that you might use a solution like this? So this actually has a lot of applications. Other areas you might use this, well, picture if you had a large room with a single switch on one side, and you're walking out the other side, you'd never switch to turn things off. You'd want a three-way, but you don't really have it. This gets that. Easy to install this. Uh, if you had a floodlight, that was controlled from maybe the garage or the living room where it isn't convenient, but you want to turn it on from the bedroom. Yep. Replace the switch, or, use the remote upstairs. Or how about the switch down in the basement where the kids always leave it on and you got to go down every time to turn it off. <laughs> now you can turn it off with that. So basically, if you wire this into any existing switch, and it's pretty easy to wire, you can add this. Exactly. And now you've changed your entire lighting plan. Completely. Very cool. And so also the app. Yeah. More functionality when you're actually working this stuff off of your phone? Much more functionality. So it's nice to have the remote link the switches to each other and to the remote. Yeah. But what the app lets you do is when you install the hub, you now have options of linking them together in scenes, creating different kinds of groups. They have a randomizer mode that if you're on vacation, it makes it look like it's lived in by turning things on and off in, in variations. Oh, so the light doesn't go on every night at 6 o'clock. Exactly. Off. Uh. Uh, create timers to turn the outside lights on when you come home and then turn back off. So that's a lot of features. Outsmart the robbers. <laughs> cool. <laughs> All right, that's good. You got me convinced. My one concern, though, is anytime I hear wireless, yeah. I think, oh, I'm going to have to reboot, reset. It's not going to work all the time. There's a history. There is. So a lot of people are still kind of stuck on the switches that came out years ago that used to have a little bit of a reliability issue. How many years are we talking? 30 plus years ago. You know, that's when the first generation of these started to come out. They had some reliability issues. Yeah. Uh, as time went on, they definitely improved, but they were still not perfect. Nowadays, you hardly notice a difference. I haven't seen these really have a glitch yet. Sounds good. Appreciate the information, Heath. You got it. All right. Well, we'd love to hear from you, so keep your emails coming. And until next time, I'm Kevin O'Connor. And I'm Heath Eastman for Ask This Old House. Thanks for watching. This Old House has got a video for just about every home improvement project, so be sure to check out the others. And if you like what you see, click on the subscribe button. Make sure that you get our newest videos right in your feed.